Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's installment of the Race in Focus series. As you may know, this series is designed to elevate conversations about teaching on race and continued disparities in our field, while also bringing research by scholars from underrepresented minorities and communities of color to the center stage. We thank our numerous sponsors, including 11 regional studies centers in the United States and the Association for Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies. Today's session is titled New Directions in Research, Russian Literature in the 19th and 20th Centuries. Our first speaker is Jose Vergara. Go ahead, Jose. Thanks, Bella. Um... So again, my name is Jose Vergara, and I am a visiting assistant professor of Russian language and culture here at Swarthmore College. Um, and I'm going to give a talk about my research, so I won't bother uh, summarizing it here. But before I begin, um, I'd also like to thank uh, all the organizers for, for putting together this really wonderful series and for the inv invitation to participate. Um, it's really an honor to be among such company and to, to have a chance to share some of my research with you all in this, this special forum. Um, so uh, first of all, I, I have to admit that when I received the invite, as well as when I saw uh, the final lineup, I was a little unsure about what I could offer. Um, as Bella noted, showcasing the work, whatever it is, of scholars from underrepresented minorities is one goal of the series, but I still wondered how and why James Joyce, of all people, could, could fit into this rubric. Um, so his work and the work of the, the Russian authors that I study can be examined in terms of race, but that's not my focus. And I wanted to be sure that I'm at least in dialogue with the stated goals and themes of the series in some meaningful way. And as I thought more about it in, in the different components of the series, I came to see at least one path, what I'm calling a, a sort of hybrid path, uh, that would tie things in with my research and with my personal experience, or at least I hope it does. Um, and I, I have this, this pet theory, it's not entirely an original one, that we all write about ourselves through our research in one way or another, intentional or not. And that's at least true for, for me. When I started my Joyce in Russia project, it's not at all what I set out to do, and yet it eventually became clear. As I wrote about how Russian writers turn to Joyce's novels uh, and ideas about paternity, as I analyze how they test options for creating their heritage through art, as I saw them reckon with losing their homeland, I realized it was also a process by which to work through my own lived experience and some of the questions that I was um, and have wrestled with. And in particular, um, to, to ad address this, I was born in Bogota, Colombia, in the late 80s, and the estimates vary, what I've heard, but my parents divorced when I was 11 or 16 days old, um, sort of unclear to me still. Uh, and from that point, I had no contact with my father and still haven't. Then when the opportunity to move to the US in 93 appeared, uh, my, mother, my mother took it. And for various reasons, I've never been back to Colombia, even though I went through the process of, of getting a Colombian passport to do so a few years ago and had to go back and forth to, to New Jersey to the consulate and it was a huge nightmare, um, still haven't managed it. And, and if you thought Russian paperwork and documentation is, is a nightmare, I guarantee that Colombian paperwork is as well. Um, so in any case, in my mind, these, these losses of a father and fatherland have always been intertwined, um, but I didn't understand the nuances, at least not at first. And when we moved to the US, the, the process of assimilation began really quickly. For the first couple of years, I was in a bilingual school program uh, for Spanish and English. But as we spoke English at home more and more, my Spanish receded and it remains a sort of uh, tricky subject. Um, and it wasn't long after our move that I took on an Americanized, Americanized name, which I kept all the way through college and a little bit beyond, in fact. Um, so there, all of this was, was at play, was taking, taking place. Um, and alongside all this, I want to emphasize just how aware I am of the privilege I hold as a white Colombian man. Um, here, and in general, I can really only speak to my own experience and my own individual issues. And for me, uh, this cognitive dissonance was very real. As a young immigrant, I felt that need to be accepted into the new culture, really losing track of my roots and the thread of my heritage in the process. 
And I think this dissonance, uh, this phenomenon, I guess, uh, still manifests itself today in what are to me strange ways. As for example, people will oft often occasionally ask me why I'm studying Russian literature as opposed to Spanish literature. Um, as if having the name Jose puts you in this particular box or on a path that you have to follow. But why am I describing all this? Um, well, it, it seems to me that many of these questions, paternity, assimilation, exile, are a major part of the Joyce and Russia story, at least the version uh, in my book, and that they speak to issues far beyond their local context. It's only in retrospect that I'd see how it's really that triple loss of father, country, language that attracted me to this research topic, at least initially, um, and, and without me being totally aware of it. Um, and although, of course, that aspect of my book isn't foregrounded, or this aspect of my work isn't foregrounded in my book, it's something deeply personal and, and at play here. Um, we naturally take a different focus, a different approach in our academic writing, uh, but this background nonetheless informs my work, even if I didn't initially realize it, or if we don't talk about it too often, I guess. But along with this personal uh, context. Today, I want to provide an overview of this project, or at least one key aspect, an introduction to my book. Um, and my talk today is called On How to Choose One's Ancestors, James Joyce in Russian Literature, in the book, which will be out um, in October, I'm excited to say, to mention, um, is called All Future Plunges to the Past, James Joyce in Russian Literature. And generally speaking, it explores the evolution of Joyce's impact on Russian literature from the mid 1920s all the way to this year, last year technically, um, and through a series of case studies, the major novels of Yuri Alyesha, Vladimir Nabokov, Andrei Bitov, Sasha Sokolov, and Mikhail Shishkin, as well as their internet intertextual connections to Joyce's fiction. Uh, after he became anathema to the Soviet regime in the 1930s, Joyce turned into to a forbidden fruit until the publication of the translation of Ulysses, a complete translation of Ulysses in the late 1980s. Nevertheless, he also became a symbol for a branch of Western literature that attracted numerous writers in the Soviet Union and Russian emigre communities. What they appreciated varied. A radical approach to language, new devices, the ability to transform one's experience as a budding artist into a national epic, a dangerous or progressive influence. Russians crafted a personal version of Joyce, a sort of my Joyce, like Moy Pushkin, my Pushkin, the, the father of, of Russian poetry and literature, while in the process responding to shared concerns, especially history and paternity. So there's individual elements, but some shared ideas at play throughout all of this. And in particular, Joyce's project to alter his past and his future through writing, as exemplified by his hero, Stephen Dedalus's theories in Ulysses, uh, which I'll describe in a second, appealed to them for numerous reasons. Russian literature's conversation with Joyce really touches on many, many subjects, uh, but this idea, this theory serves as a major through line that I follow in my book. Uh, these writers are obsessed with the question of lineage, both biological and literary, partly because the Russian historical experience um, altered how writers might relate to their predecessors by limiting access to them. So we had 70-ish uh, years of Soviet rule when certain things couldn't be read quite as easily, let's say, like Joyce. And for this reason, Stephen's Shakespeare theory, which again, I'll, I'll get to in a second, serves as a productive lens uh, for examining these writers' relations to Joyce. His idea, Joyce's idea, is that an artist can rewrite the past by selecting a literary forefather in place of a biological one by creating lasting art. So according to Stephen, Joyce's hero, Shakespeare became father to himself by writing Hamlet and engendering the world's conception of, of the bard of Shakespeare at once father and son. So he creates what comes after him, this idea of capital uh, S, Shakespeare, big uh, Shakespeare, um, and uh, changes what comes before in this way too. He rewrites personal history and inscribes himself into world literature and sort of cuts any sort of uh, filial bonds, any requirement to uh, follow what came before you. This theory served as an impetus in different ways and to different extents 
uh, for my five writers' experiments, but how they each adapt and respond to it also allows us to see more clearly their anxieties in general and in relation to Joyce. So Aliesha, for instance, incorporates uh, situation rhymes, very similar situations, characters, uh, traits that are direct allusions to Ulysses and the characters in Joyce's novel, um, and then slightly changes them, alters them, challenges them in different ways. And again, one of the main ones is they both have these young artist heroes um, who are attempting to create a new legacy in Joyce's novel. The hero, Stephen Dedalus, can head out on his own into the dark night, uh, leave behind a potential adoptive father and say, no, I'm going to go my own way. Uh, but Eliesha, facing the pressures and the challenges of the early Soviet era, can't do that. He appreciates what uh, uh, Joyce proposes doing through this project, through this theory, but he has to turn it down or he chooses to at least. And tracing these various modifications to the Joycean model and their engagement with the Irish author over time reveals how they conceptualize the historical changes that affected their sense of political and cultural positionality. What was possible? What was desirable? Where did Russian literature belong? In the ways each author replies to Joyce, we see, among other things, how they tackled these questions, but they also, of course, address the more personal aspect that I started with. What are our roots? Who are our forefathers? Can we select them or are we bound to these lines? Can we rewrite what we perceive to be harmful narratives or recoup ones that have been lost? In many cases, as in my own personal circumstances, they felt cast out and their processing of these questions along with their direct engagement with Joyce is partly what helps generate their artistic innovations. The circumstances uh, in each case of each author's biography predicate each reaction, each version of Joyce whom they're reading and engaging. So in other words, Joyce, uh, Liesh's Joyce of the 20s is much different, both metaphorically and literally in terms of the translation he had access to than the Joyce read at the fall of the USSR. So what I'm looking at is not just one monolithic Joyce, um, that covers the last 100 years or so, uh, but rather a series of different choices, multiple choices, which is kind of a scary thought. More than one choice, one is enough. So now what I'd like to do with my remaining time is provide examples from two of these novels, one early and one more recent, to demonstrate how their author's uh, answers to Joyce develop this broader conversation about identity and belonging. And here in you know, 20, 25 minutes, um, I can only offer a wide view even as I zoom into a few particular examples, but I hope uh, that these examples uh, give a sense of the connections that I'm making between Joyce and 20th and 21st century Russian literature. So to start, uh, a central principle of Nabokov's final Russian novel, The Gift, involves the protagonist Fyodor's attempts to merge his father, the biological figure whom Stephen calls a necessary evil, with Pushkin, a literary father. Uh, Fyodor finds that Pushkin comes to permeate the biography that he's writing of his father, the biography of Konstantin Kirillovich Kadunov Chertinsev, this mouthful of a name, uh, who's presumed dead after disappearing on an expedition in Central Asia. And he writes, what the narr narrator writes, Pushkin entered his blood. With Pushkin's voice merged the voice of his father, from Pushkin's prose, he had passed to his life, so that in the beginning, the rhythm of Pushkin's era commingled with the rhythm of his father's life. The merging of fathers going on here. And this project bears some similarity, if in refracted form, to the ideas proposed by Stephen in Ulysses. Stephen seeks to put himself at a clear remove from his, from his perspective, disappointing biological father by electing a literary precursor, Shakespeare, and by fathering himself through art generating his, his legacy, how he'll be remembered through art. Fyodor, by contrast, wants to unite the biological with the literary, the filial with the artistic. And for him, reclaiming a literary tradition by uniting it with his own personal and family histories is equated with overturning recent events and recovering his father, who comes to stand for the culture seemingly inaccessible to him as a Russian emigre. It's all been left behind in, in Russia. Uh, this relationship contrasts with those of Kavlyarev and Stephen with their respective fathers, as they feel that they completely understand their paternal figures and view them in a negative light. They can see all their faults and um, 
issues with them. The unknowability of Konstantin Kirillovich has disappeared in Thrall's field, because if his father cannot be summed up, then the idea of him, his mysterious nature, his potential existence, all continue on. Um, in other words, you can idealize that or whom you don't really know or know anymore. But the question is, how do you want, how does one do this? Uh, for these writers, it's a process equal parts elusive, narratological, and metaphysical. So in other words, they inscribe these, uh, these illusions, these, these different elements into the text itself, into the words, but at the same time, there's a kind of spiritual, metaphysical uh, element at play as well. And the gift is imbued with Pushkinian references that drive the project's momentum in developing associative illusions to unite biological father, literary father, and son, as when Fyodor echoes a Pushkin poem, traveling complaints that list these various possible deaths that Pushkin imagines for himself. Um, he incorporates the, uh, something similar into his biography of his father. And uh, both Nabokov and Joyce and Stephen and Fyodor also uh, use direct quotations from historical sources um, about Shakespeare or about Central Asia. They're, they're going about this project in very similar ways. The vast number of references to Shakespeare's work throughout Ulysses serves to give the text the, the Shakespearean tint in characterization, dialogue, and situation rhymes. As Fyodor's father is granted Pushkin traits, so too is Stephen's potential father substitute, Leopold Bloom, the no novel's other kind hero, serendipitously equated uh, with the young writer's ideal artist, the Shakespeare he depicts in his speech. Unlike Fyodor, however, Stephen meets his hybrid figure, his Bloom Shakespeare figure, but doesn't realize it and turns down his well-intentioned offers of assistance. He heads out on his own. And thus, Nabokov manipulates the same ideas, selecting one's ancestors, merging fathers, but swerves away from the component of Joyce's endeavor that seeks to divide. The bulk of reworking of Joyce's project serves to correct it according to his beliefs and position as an emigre writer. And again, here, the circumstances in the 1920s and 1930s dictate that the bulk of used these tools differently. Writers uh, during this time uh, were endeavoring to make sense of this situation abroad vis-a-vis -vis their cultural heritage. Had Russian literature come to an end with their departure, would it continue to thrive abroad? Could immigrate art exist without links to the Russian soil, to the Russian language? Who do you become when you're separated from your homeland, from Russia, from Colombia? Is it a new self? If for Fyodor, the fathers may be estranged, then for Fyodor, uh, excuse me, for, for Stephen, the fathers may be estranged. Then for Fyodor Nabokov, to do so would mean to unravel everything. Nabokov saw the value in Stephen's Shakespeare project, but his own novel, a translation of Ulysses in the key of Russian emigre life, opts for an alternative course. And here I, I really do mean to suggest that the gift is a translation of Ulysses. Uh, Nabokov wrote to Joyce in 1931 with an offer to translate Ulysses. It obviously didn't come to pass. Um, unfortunately, you can imagine what that would look like. Um, but there are many, many similarities between their books, especially as concerned the, the artist figure and the novels have been analyzed and read in many of the same ways. So to me, it's a translation in spirit, the closest we can get. Uh, switching now to, to Shishkin, Mikhail Shishkin, his 2005 novel, Maiden Hair, takes yet another step in Russian literature's engagement with Stephen's theory. In Shishkin's book, a new element, namely an effort to reintegrate Russian literature into world culture after the Soviet experiment emerges. Joyce acts as a prism through which Shishkin views this effort, both a means and a model. For instance, uh, in an interview, he said that he wants to merge the Western traditions, quote, love of the word, which for him is exemplified by Joyce, with the Russian traditions, love of man, embodied by Nikolai Gogol's short story, The Overcoat. Shishkin's engagement with Joyce therefore operates on several levels, in addition to thematic links, such as those I've described. Um, in addition to this, Shishin has made a name for himself as a scissors and paste man, uh, to borrow Joyce's tongue-in-cheek term for his method of incorporating bits of text written by others and plots into his own works. These authors have been accused both jokingly and seriously of plagiarism. In addition, Shishkin deploys a type of stream of consciousness that might be called a collective stream of consciousness. 
a stream of collective consciousness. For by the end of Maiden Hair, the reader hears not just the voice of a single character like we do at the end of Ulysses with Molly Bloom and all her thoughts as she's falling asleep, uh, but instead a cacophony of, of sources. And these two techniques, along with other things, provide valuable entry points into how Shishkin's and Joyce's novels resonate. But more importantly, they speak to Shishkin's efforts to chart a new course for Russian literature, one that takes Joyce's works as a springboard because of their ability to bring together disparate traditions, many voices and styles. It wants to, to merge. Beyond the technical level, uh, certain images and situations rhyme or, or resonate. Uh, at one point, for example, Shishkin, Shishkin's protagonist, an unnamed Russian interpreter working in Switzerland, so another self-exile, imagines a conversation with a former girlfriend. They discuss how they feel themselves turning into their parents, which I think is a, a relatable fear for a lot of us. Sorry, mom. And the woman says, his girlfriend says, sometimes I caught myself thinking with horror that I understood and felt everything my mother understood and felt. Here, you and I loved each other, but in my head, I thought that maybe my mom loved my father exactly the same way. She and I suddenly united, merged, and you have exactly the same kind of mole below your shoulder blade as my father did. What she says here calls to mind Stephen's uh, proclamations. He says, and as the mole on my right breast is where it was when I was born, though all my body has been woven of new stuff time after time, so through the ghost of the unquiet father, the image of the unliving son looks forth. So in the future, the sister of the past, I may see myself as I sit here now, but by reflection from that which then I shall be. It's convoluted, but beautiful, beautiful Joycean language. Stephen's speech is wrapped up in his interrogations of what paternity means, metaphysically and poetically speaking. Here he suggests that as the, uh, the human body constantly reinvents itself, cells reproduce, skin falls off, et cetera. Um, so too may the creative artist fashion a new identity and establish new bonds between the past and the future, the present and the future. For him, the mole is a symbol of the trace that remains despite the body's constant renewal. For the interpreter's girlfriend, it results in certain anxieties similar to Stevens, the fear of turning into one's parents, of inheriting their imperfections, and all the same, in the small, the child can be seen in the father, as if the former gives meaning to the latter. What comes after gives meaning uh, to what comes before, instead of the opposite. His girlfriend asks the interpreter uh, whether the interpreter ever felt, ever felt the same thing. And he responds, once, yes. And for an instant, the rattling train car seemed to me a submarine, and I was him, my father. He and I became a single whole time and everything else suddenly turned to nothing. I was my father. Again, the theme of echoing stories uniting generations. Whereas Alyosha's hero Cavaliero freezes up at the thought that he has become his father and the bulk of Sjodor cherishes this idea, the interpreter gains insight into the nature of time when he remembers the sensation on a train. The structure of Maiden Hair reflects the same epiphany as characters blend in and out of each other, resulting in the simultaneity of temporal planes. The son can feel at one with the father, even one that's long deceased, thanks to the transformative power of memory and art. If, if for Joyce, the ultimate goal of his Shakespeare theory is to redefine his lineage and to become father to himself and to his nation through revolutionary art, then Shishkin, responding to the disorder after the fall of the Soviet Union, modifies the scope of the equation. He comes out the, uh, the other side of the end of history, the so-called end of history, to put the pieces together and to reintegrate Russian literature into world culture. His choice of an already world-weary hero reflects a major difference from how previous writers perceived Joyce's project. Shishkin does not elect a single forefather. Taking instead a decidedly anti-historicist view, he sees how he is only one in a chain. And as a result, all eras become equal. Shishkin underscores the iterative nature of the stories we tell. And in doing so, he highlights yet another aspect of Joyce's artistry, one that really came uh, to full fruition in Finnegan's Wake, the universality of human experience. So Shishkin's resurrection of the past and of the fathers in opposition to Nabokov's more personal efforts in the gift or to those of his nationalistic contemporaries today is global in nature and achieved through his reworkings of parts of others' writings. It's more um, 
uh, cosmopolitan. And the major difference is that the struggle with forefathers, or another major difference, I should say, uh, is that this struggle with forefathers no longer occurs, simply a recuperation of a tradition's place in literary history. Through Shishkin's engagement with Joyce and his use of similar images, devices, other components, his efforts to craft a cosmopolitan conception of Russian literature become clearer. Reading Joyce in Russia after 1991 could, be, could, could mean becoming lost in the ahistorical jumble caused by the Soviet experiment's disruptions, taking the old for the new when, when everything was being published for the first time and you were competing with your predecessors. Instead, Shishkin uses these peculiar conditions to his advantage. So looking at all this together, Joyce provided Russian writers with one tool, at least one tool to re-examine their paternity, which Joyce famously called a legal fiction in Ulysses on both individual and national levels. I demonstrated in my book how they translated this idea within their respective historical cultural contexts. They're not literal translations. The closest we get is Nabokov's uh, gift, which was originally called Da, yes, uh, not dar, the gift, but da, yes, uh, which alludes to the end of Ulysses. But precisely for this reason, uh, we gain insights into how these writers tackle Joyce's main themes. And so what I propose is that these odd novels, the Russian ones and Joyce's give us, are parallels and insights into matters of identity. When you shed one identity, whether due to external pressures or otherwise, the discomfort can set in in unexpected ways, as it did for me and as it does for these characters, and, and over time, it can shift. Nabokov, Shishkin, and others attempt to fix, determine, create a heritage to elect ancestors. And these efforts, of course, are really about making sense of their identity. In other words, their texts speak to the context in which they were written, but they also reflect our own desire to shape the future by developing an affiliation with certain pasts. And in studying their work, I came to understand better my own path. So with this project, uh, I'm interested, that should be clear by now, for both personal and academic reasons and how Joyce became a symbol for many things for Russian authors. An exile, a peripheral writer, a technical innovator, a symbol for the free spirit of prose, a hooligan, as one of my interview subjects uh, called him, a master of life creation, um, a concept embodied in a certain sense, by his Shakespeare theory. I'm less interested in the critical response, how critics read him or critiqued him uh, in the Soviet Union. This is a subject that was already examined in great detail by the late Neil Cornwell, among others, and, and quite well at that. Um, it would also be easy to say that these Russian writers simply sought to attach themselves to Joyce's name, to a brighter star, to kind of elevate their own prestige. And to some extent, sure especially in some cases, but it's also about so much more, about manifesting your past through father figures you select, about identity shifting because of a loss of home, tradition, language, parent. And in that absence, and through the Joycean prism, they find ways to make new meaning, new connections, new dialogues. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lindsay Ceballos. Go ahead, Lindsay. Thank you, Bella. Um, I just also want to thank the organizers, all the sponsors for the talk for inviting me. Um, and a special thanks to Sarah, Laura, and Juja for all your organizing. And I'm really honored to be here with Jose and with Bella. Um, so, my name is Lindsay Ceballos, and I'm assistant professor at Lafayette College um, in the Russian and East European Studies program. And this year, I'm also a postdoctoral fellow uh, at the Davis Center at Harvard. So I'm going to take you back a little before um, the historical period that Jose just talked about. Um, but the theme of literary paternity is going to continue. Um, which I wanted to note after hearing Jose's talk. So I'm gonna share my screen now. My talk today comes out of my book project on the reception of Fyodor Dostoevsky in the religious thought and literary criticism of the Silver Age in Russian culture. So this is roughly between 1890 and 1917. In particular, I look at thinkers associated with what's now called the Russian religious renaissance, 
And in case studies, I propose some origins for why we associate Dostoevsky with the values and ideas we associate him with. Often, it's assumed that the thinkers and critics who first took Dostoevsky seriously as a religious thinker or even a prophet used him as a launching pad for their own ideas. I am more interested in how the reading of his work actually generated a new image of Dostoevsky, a usable version of him in their historical moment. Dostoevsky's afterlife departed considerably from the conservative legacy he left when he died in 1881. When he died, uh, well, sorry, today I wanna focus on one of the chapters of the book, which looks at a growing trend in the 1890s, which is this juxtaposition of Lev Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Um, so I've chosen to represent this on my title screen with dead Dostoevsky and living Tolstoy, which is already kind of showing how unfair the competition between them was in the period that I'm working on. Um, so in the West, this question of Tolstoy or Dostoevsky, uh, Tolstoy versus Dostoevsky is associated with a variety of figures. Um, and it comes up in Virginia Woolf's essay, The Russian Point of View. Uh, it's gestured towards in the critic George Steiner's classic work, Tolstoy or Dostoevsky from 1959. And most famously, it's, it's, it's sort of the pivot of the Russian thinker Mikhail Bakhtin's problems of Dostoevsky's poetics. So we often understand the question, Tolstoy or Dostoevsky, as if it were a competition between two approaches to the art of the novel. But the origins of this competition show it wasn't really a competition at all. For the generation of critics who first made these comparisons, it was undoubtedly Dostoevsky who won this debate. It might be a good time to explain why this competition was rigged. When Dostoevsky died in 1881, he left the religious project of Brothers Karamazov unfinished. In the previous year, he delivered his famous Pushkin speech and was at the height of his popularity. Alongside this narrative, we have Tolstoy, who had famously abandoned the spiritual questions of literature for social activism and moral philosophy. He was viewed by a younger generation of writers who were torn between Marxism, Russian populism, and new religious stirrings with a mixture of admiration and disappointment. They'd come to see his promotion of non-resistance to evil and rejection of aesthetic beauty as a kind of abject asceticism. When Tolstoy was excommunicated from the church in 1901, it seemed to symbolize a tragic rift between culture and religion, and that ensured that the questions they posed had a contemporary relevance. So for the generation of religious thinkers that I'm looking at, Tolstoy's moral philosophical Christianity did not offer a solution to the crisis they identified in their time and in the historical development of Christianity more broadly. Dostoevsky's unfinished but compelling religious ideas on the other hand did. And for the two critics I'll speak about today, um, Vasily Rozanov and Dmitry Mirishkovsky, Dostoevsky's religion, which seemed to transcend conventional moral categories and offered space for mystical ways of knowing, was the antidote for everything that was wrong with Christianity and the Orthodox Church in their time. But their interest in Dostoevsky and Tolstoy also reflected their moments' anxieties about Russian identity. And here is where race as a critical framework starts to enter the picture. But first, I want to review a little bit what Rozanov and Mirishkovsky thought had gone wrong in Christianity that Dostoevsky was in a position to correct. Both men agreed that the development of Christianity had led to a preference for dogma and asceticism and an abandonment of the inner spiritual demands of human life. They they disagreed, however, about the source of these aesthetic forces. Mirishkovsky worked out his understanding of this problem in his influential study, which is called simply Lev Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, which became 
which began publication in 1900 in a leading art and literary journal of the time called The World of Art. This work was aligned with other 19th century investigations into the origins of Christianity, which often relied on Semitic and Aryan racial typologies to distinguish between the two societies whose collision it was thought gave rise to early Christianity. By the end of the century, racial typologies were still employed as a mode of historical and cultural analysis, but their appearance increasingly intersected with knowledge generated by the newish discipline of physical anthropology, the scientific study of race and modern psychopathology. So in his famous study on the two writers, Miroskowski claimed that the ascetic turn in Christianity had pernicious Semitic origins. For him, Tolstoy's false Christianity was a kind of atavistic return to Semitic origins, which he claimed had infected Aryan culture. He wrote, the poison was so strong that one drop was enough to infect the new Aryan tribes, having only just flooded in from Asia to Europe, which subsequently due to their extreme youth was defenseless before all of this cultural poison. The old man had infected the child. Tolstoy, who I understand to be the old man in this description, is also consistently associated with Semitic forces in history, Old Testament prophets, and the so-called Judaizing heresy of 15th century Novgorod. At one point in the study, Mitishkovsky refers to Tolstoy's, quote, bloodless, circumcised Christianity, unquote. Dostoevsky, on the other hand, isn't associated with Semitic or Aryan typologies. He embodies a kind of post-Christian, post-racial future that has yet to be realized. So Miroshkovsky's racialization of Tolstoy is part of an attempt to enhance his critique of the writer's false Christianity as he sees it. And I argue it was formulated in a response to what he thought was this Semitizing trend um, that he was seeing in the reception of Dostoevsky's religious thought. At the same time Miroshkovsky was publishing this study on both writers, Rosanov was writing prolifically on ancient um, Jewish religious ritual, the history of religion and antiquity in general, and Russian literature, sometimes all at the same time. Um, Early on, when he was still teaching at a provincial high school, and pretty unknown still, Rosanov had written his own book on Dostoevsky. But this earlier book conveyed an understanding of Christianity, um, which was much more positive. But by the end of the 1890s, Rosanov was convinced that the dominance of ascetic practices in modern Christianity was just the culmination of flaws inherent in Christianity itself. Rosanov looked more deeply into the past, back to ancient Semitic and Egyptian cultures where history was murkier and more pliable to his imaginative capacity. He came to believe that Christianity's lapsed state could be achieved through reconnecting with the life-affirming rituals of Judaism and ancient Semitic culture. Dostoevsky Rosanov argued at the time embodied the spirit of Semitic proximity to divine revelation, a mystical knowing. And so here we have Miroshkovsky's Semitic Tolstoy um, as being a direct response to Rosanov's Semitic Dostoevsky. Both were working to solidify Dostoevsky's legacy as a, as a Christian prophet, but through opposite interpretations of the history of Christianity. I'll now move to giving some examples of how Rosanov connected Dostoevsky's thought to the ancient Semites and summarize his conflict with Miroshkovsky before ending with some larger conclusions and contexts. Rosanov's cultural historical reasons for rejecting Christianity hinged on his identification of Semitism with um, life affirmation and his understanding of Christianity as a kind of death cult. More and more, Semitism became a solution to the ascetic dogmatism he identified in the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, 
expressed in its strict divorce policies, which directly affected him personally, and its rejection of sexuality. In keeping with his embrace of Semitic culture, Rosanoff in these years devised some of his previous, revised some of his previous arguments and now claimed that Jewish ritual in fact showed an intimate connection to the external natural world and a related capacity for producing art. Such an argument was necessary to his attacks on Christianity as life denying, but it was also an integral element in his Semitization of Dostoevsky. In a multi-part 1899 essay entitled On Ancient Egyptian Beauty, Rosanov's entry point into proving Dostoevsky's affinity with the mysticism of the ancient Semites is through two pretty unlikely lenses. Uh, the first is the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, and the second is the villain of Dostoevsky's novel, Crime and Punishment, Svidrigailov. In his interpretations of hieroglyphics, like the ones on the slide, Rosanov explained how ancient Egyptian depictions of death reveal little difference in their understanding of life and the afterlife. After death, here governance continues, their agricultural cycles persist. It would clarify things at this point to say that Rosanov understood ancient Egyptian culture as a Semitic civilization. And this is where things start to get a little confusing. <laughs> Halfway through this essay, one of Dostoevsky's sensualist characters, Svidrigailov, emerges as an inheritor of this earthly vision of the afterlife. At one point in the novel, Svidrigailov and Raskolnikov have a rather theological discussion about life after death, in which Svidrigailov reveals he believes in immortality of a kind that maybe few would desire, but that has emphatic bodily proportions. So this is a brief quote from Svidrigailov's musing on this afterlife. He says, just suppose it's nothing but a single little room, something like a village bathhouse, all grimy with soot, with spiders in all the corners. And that's eternity for you. And that's a translation by Nicholas Pasternak. And this is a pretty well-known moment in the novel. So Rosanov takes this confession as a sign of Sidrigailov's insightful mysticism, which is even more profound given the criminal proportions of his sort of earthliness, his lust, his sensuality. Because as we know, some of us may remember Sidrigailov is associated with spousal murder. He's associated also with, um, you know, um, uh, child rape. So when a Jewish fireman makes an appearance close to the uh, end of the novel, and basically at the moment, Svidrigailov kind of initiates his, his final suicide attempt, Rosanov has all the evidence he needs of a connection between Svidrigailov's spiritual integrity and ancient Egyptian Semitic death cults. Rosanov asks, quote, why having drawn in his entire work no more than two or three Jewish figures does Dostoevsky put one of them there, leading Svidrigailov before his end face to face with a Jew, end quote. By the essay's final installment, Rosanov puts two and two together. Dostoevsky is a figure of our history and an enormous one at that. What matters is the person who drew these characters and thousands of others and with insatiable energy spoke about the mysteries of eternity and the grave. This person is already an erasable point of our historic course, the unerasable feature of also general European development, even Aryan development. We know Semites as a race, but there's also Semitism as a point of view, as a trend of awareness, and Dostoevsky belongs to this. In his face, we observe suddenly the characteristic head of a Jew, not of our own time, but an ancient Jew. In his writings of those years, there are other examples of this kind of associative logic that ties Dostoevsky's mysticism to Semitic roots. And this, but this is just the most emphatic. For time, I can't get into the other ones. Mirishkovsky, to go back to this sort of 
invisible polemic, was reading Rosanov's essays during the same period he was writing his landmark study on the two writers and his private correspondence reveals his anxieties about this Semitic turn in his friend's way of thinking. Rosanov's rejection of Christianity was especially concerning being that the two of them were supposedly allies in a cultural awakening of this very religion um, for the future of Russia. In May 1900, Mirishkovsky wrote to a close colleague, quote, in Rosanov, a passing into Semitism is beginning. Sometimes he is pure Jew, not even an Egyptian. But in any case, we need him because he's an enormous talent, end quote. There's little evidence that Mirishkovsky ever considered making these disagreements public, at least I haven't yet found any, even though their critical divergence on the question of Semitism was in print, if, if people wanted to see it. So at this point, I'd like to widen the picture slightly and suggest that Mirishkovsky's concerns about shaping Dostoevsky's legacy and what fueled his particular scapegoating of Tolstoy was a fear of not one, but two Semitic tendencies that he was seeing in contemporary writing about Dostoevsky. So the first I've already outlined, um, it was represented by Rosanov. Um, Mirishkovsky was hoping to respond to his anti-Christian philo-Semitism. Um, and he was also trying to counter Rosanov's portrayal of Dostoevsky's Semitic spirituality. But the second kind of Semitism Mirishkovsky was responding to um, was the Jewish heritage and what he believed to be the Semitic minds of his Jewish rivals in literary philosophical criticism. The philosopher Liv Shistov and the literary critic Akim Balinsky um, wrote also extensively about the lasting significance of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, among other historical figures. When Mirishkovsky was writing his novel about Leonardo da Vinci, Resurrected Gods, Valinsky was doing his own research on that artist. And Valinsky had also written extensively on sensuality in Dostoevsky's novels. These are two of his publications dedicated to Dostoevsky. The first one, or the earlier one, is Kingdom of the Karamazovs. And the second one, I'll say a little bit about in a second, um, A Book of Great Wrath. Occasionally, these kinds of literary rivalries, as in the case with Lev Shistov, were brought into sharp relief. For example, the conclusion of Mirishkovsky's two-year serialized publication of his study on Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, and the beginning of Shistov's book-length study of Dostoevsky and Nietzsche appeared in the same issue of the World of Art Journal. So this um, image here, um, uh, at the first page of that, first installment of Shistov's study of Dostoevsky and Nietzsche's where is, is from that very issue in the World of Art Journal. The professional and intellectual sparring, no doubt invited by all of these shared interests was in Mirishkovsky's private and public writings lowered to the level of racial prejudice. Privately, Mirishkovsky's notion of a Semitic cast of mind extended to his appraisal of Shistov's first book the good and the teaching of Tolstoy and Nietzsche. In a letter from March 1900, Mirishkovsky wrote, his book is remarkable, although it is undoubtedly Semitic, written as if neither Christ nor Christianity ever existed. And indeed, as always with expletive, even in Spinoza, it's that and yet not about that, or it is about that and yet not that. But in any case, it would be curious to meet up with the Schwarzman. And he uses Shistov's very Jewish sounding last name when he refers to him in letters. This anti-Semitic reception of Shistov's work has a parallel in his later Semitization of Tolstoy. In the same issue where Shistov's own essay on the Stajewski and Nietzsche appeared and where Mirishkovsky ended his study, Mirishkovsky used similar language to dispute the authenticity of Tolstoy's Christianity, saying, 
when he speaks about Christianity, one feels he's not at all speaking about that. It's all the same, true or untrue, but mainly not about that. Miroskovsky had also written much earlier about Volinsky's Semitic critical tendencies as revealing a fascination or genuine purity, um, what he called the naivete of philosophical ardor, the fiery and yet chaste passion of mind, end quote, all descriptors which accord with his later portrayal of Semitism in his study. But here, it's possible that Volinsky's 1903 study of Dostoevsky's novel Devils, a book of great wrath, which is one of the images on the slide, um, was a deliberate attempt to respond to and possibly provoke Miroshkovsky. In his book, Volinsky compared Dostoevsky to the Old Testament prophet Jonah. His understanding of Jonah was tied to George Frederick Watts's depiction an image important enough to his interpretation that he chose it for the cover of his book and included it in the volume with a brief justification for its inclusion, which is a little unusual. About the painting, Volinsky wrote, looking at Watts's painting, you involuntarily recall the author of Devils, his great wrath and great blindness in relation to Europe and to non-Orthodox peoples. He also threw burning pitch at everything that was behind the boundary of his Byzantine purview. He also believed in the exceptional God-bearing quality of his people. This sort of ideological and patriotic spasm occurs in all of his works. And it seems sometimes that he is entirely in this convulsion in this merciless judgment of the existing world and this fiery nationalism. At times like Jonah, he approaches rebellion against God like for example, in the colossal poetic figure of Ivan Karamazov. But Dostoevsky of course is not Jonah. All the same, like Jonah, he wanted to take away the prophetic gift of other peoples. And meanwhile, with his powerful art, serve the human being in general, that is all peoples regardless of their national divisions. So this is sort of a, an unusual um, kind of response in the narrative that I'm the polemic that I'm reconstructing here. So I wanted to, to read the whole portion of it. Valinsky's was a more measured interpretation of Dostoevsky's spiritual power that Brozenev might have agreed with, but that likely um, would have infuriated Miroshkovsky. He possibly might even known it was a direct response to him since at this time they were not friendly at all. In responding to these various semitizations of Dostoevsky, it's possible that Miroshkovsky was also aware of and eager to dispute Tolstoy's declaration, which is attributed to Maxim Gorky, that, quote, there was something Jewish in Dostoevsky's blood, unquote. So what can we make of this polemic about who is more Jewish, which is the essential question, Tolstoy or Dostoevsky? In reconstructing this debate, it helps me to understand the stakes of the competition in the first place. It's not really about artistic differences. Um, it's about spiritual fitness, um, the historical development of Russia and national identity. The initial Tolstoy versus Dostoevsky debate shows not only different visions of the future of religion, but also the new ways that Russian critics at this period were assigning or affixing racial identities onto the most valued cultural figures of their literary heritage. The question was no longer only about whether one writer skewed Westerner or Slavophile, but in addition to this, which cultural typology, Aryan or Semitic, that either most embodied or transcended. Race and its fictions played a pivotal role in this history. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for these um, terrific presentations, these really um, stimulating and insightful talks, Jose and Lindsay. Um, so I think that your work has a great deal in the way of uh, generative spaces of contact and conversation. 
Um, I have thoughts and questions for you in three areas, but you definitely need not respond to all three, just respond to whatever seems relevant or interesting. So it seems to me that both of your talks uh, deal with some of the founding myths and some of the founding figures in Russian as well as perhaps world literature. And in that sense, I'm inclined to suggest that both of your talks deal with literary or more broadly cultural paternity and the attendant practices of reception. That is rereading, rejection, embrace, revision, interpretation. So here's the beginning of my first question. Um, it seems to me that in both cases, the thinkers and writers you examine, that is whether Rosanov and Yushkovsky or Nabokov and Shishkin are working with an acute awareness of transcultural flow and perhaps, especially in the case of Jose's subject, a growing awareness of what Pascal Casanova has called the World Republic of Letters. I wonder if you would each agree that the Russian cultural producers you examine, read and interpret, whether through criticism or artistic activity, whether Dostoevsky or, or, or Joyce, um, in an effort to reshape, reimagine, and, and ultimately, I would say, to curate or to circulate Russian culture for explicitly global or transcultural consumption. So I wondered if you would speak more about how your writers imagine the context or the audience um, for their utterances. Is it a global audience? Are they, are they writing for a transnational public? And then is there a tension between writing for local, whether national or emigre, as for example, in the case of Nabokov, and global consumption? And then how might we define the global or the transnational in each of your cases? How far is its reach? Whom does it include? Whom does it exclude? In other words, when Rosanov and Yushkovsky are reframing Russian religious culture and national fashioning, or when Nabokov and Shushkin write their Joycean novels, who is their audience? And how does this audience shape their utterances? Of course, all of this bearing in mind that the writer's audience is always a fiction. Um, second question, the status of the novel as an, eminent, as an eminently exportable generic form is unsurprisingly big in all of this. And I wanna ask you to elaborate on this point. It may seem like the novel as a form of cultural expression is more important or more explicitly important for Jose, but surely this is also how Dostoevsky became Dostoevsky, right, in, in, in Lindsay's narrative. And so I, I wondered if we want to think together about the status of novelistic discourse and the status especially of the novel as a thing, read, bought, sold, circulated, sent places and so forth. Um, I mentioned this because both the novel generally and specific subgenres of novelistic discourse, notably the Bildungsroman, have been implicated in 19th, 20th, and 21st century transcultural flow, have been seen as kind of objects of global consumption. And so I'm wondering if we can add to that conversation. So what does your work contribute to what we know about these, this kind of the global transnational traffic in novels? So in this context, do you see the novel as a vessel for the transmission of Russian national self-fashioning? Do you see it as an agent for the dawn of a world literature paradigm? And if so, what is the status of the national in that context? Is the national as a, as a category of cultural production and reception diminished or amplified or otherwise transformed in the course of transcultural flow? And finally, the third area, and again, you need not respond to each area, but you're both dealing with modernisms. And so I wonder again, as with the novel, if you'd speak to the nature of your contributions to the comparative study of modernism as a global or global globalizing literary and artistic movement. So Lindsay, when you open up this rich and, and, and fascinating collection of social, scientific and religious discourses that racialize their subjects, how do you hope to shift, to shift and shape conversations about Russian religious thought, but I think also about Russian modernism, since both Rosanov and Yushkovsky were enormously influential in that context. Um, so is speaking about their racializing or ethnicizing rhetoric, for example, a, a way to begin decolonizing the study of Russian modernism? And then what would the implications of decolonizing Russian modernism be? Or like, you know, can you speak about what that would look like? Um, kind of relatedly, since I think your project is on Silver Age readings of the Stoyevsky, um, kind of another related question might be, how do you, how do you want us to 
reevaluate the silver age due to your interventions, or even in the to think of it from the kind of um, mutually illuminating character of re reception studies. What do we learn about Dostoevsky? How do we see him anew? And what do we learn about the Silver Age in the context of reception studies? So how do you want us to recast the Silver Age while paying close attention to the racializing and ethnicizing moves performed by these thinkers? Um, Jose, you, pr you present this, this veritable Joycean century of Russian literature. And, and, and the picture um, of modernism you present, and of course it's a kind of comparative modernism, um, is fatherless. In other words, it's a tradition that's flexible about paternity, which is figured repeatedly, it would seem as unstable, multiple, dynamic, rather than fixed. So I'm wondering, um, in exploring the Russian Joyce's, so to speak, to what extent are you charting an alternative history of Russian literature? And would you call it alternative or something else? Do the successive Joycean turns evince an awareness of Russian Joycean predecessors? So in other words, is your book also in part about inheriting other Russian writers' Joyce's? Is there a Joycean intertextual thread in, in 20th and 20th century Russian literature and how would you characterize its significance? And ultimately, I guess I'm also wondering, you kind of gestured towards this in, uh, towards the, the end of your talk. Um, I'd love to hear what you think about um, the implications of this, this Russian gesture of building a tradition by engaging with someone who himself was writing to a certain extent from the periphery. So do you see this as an instance of periphery to periphery cultural flow? Um, so thank you both again for these presentations. Please go ahead and respond and then we'll open up the discussion. I can go first as opposed to since Lindsay um, just went. Uh, thank you so much, Bella. These are <laughs> amazing thoughts and questions. Um, and I think I will, for the sake of time, just maybe collapse the, the first and the second and maybe touch on the third. Um, but it seems like the first and second question were similar in a certain sense. Uh, so the question of whether these writers, these Russian writers in responding to Joyce and creating their, their Joyce, um, their respective Joyce's are kind of in, in writing these novels are curating or sharing Russian culture with the, with the world, whether it's local or uh, a more global enterprise, um, if I understood your question correctly. Um, and uh, I think it's both and it depends on, on each of, uh, on which writer we're, we're discussing. Um, so looking at my two examples with Nabokov, for me, the gift uh, is very much Russian in the sense of uh, what he's describing, what he's experiencing in Russian emigre life at least, um, but translating all of Joyce's tools and methods and um, kind of development of this artistic figure into something that makes more sense within that local level. Um, and in the chapter from which this is derived, I do look at Ben Sinister, Nabokov's uh, second, English language novel where I would say it's more of the kind of global or even more Western oriented uh, perspective where he's engaging with Shakespeare and Joyce um, actively in uh, Finnegan's Wake and parroting even more there. Um, but in comparison to Shishkin, who's very much Western oriented, cosmopolitan, wants to um, incorporate Russian literature and certainly his own works into the West, and the Western tradition, um, I, I think that these are two good, uh, serve as two really good examples of this difference. Um, so there's that quote, right, that I said that he wants to merge the two traditions. He's lived in Switzerland since the late 90s, this, this semi-exilic uh, existence. Um, uh, and uh, has started writing in, in German, uh, I mean, for some time he's written in German, but a lot of what he's writing now is German. So I think that also speaks to his practice of speaking to this desire to um, shift things over. Um, and one of the things he wrote is a kind of guidebook to Russian culture in general and Russian culture in Switzerland, but in German um, as kind of the curation that you're talking about. 
um, reaching another audience um, and blending blending these two together. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there and if there's time, maybe address more, but Lindsay. Thank you, thank you, Bella. Um, these are great things to think about. Um, and I'm glad you asked me again, like Jose, I guess I'll just choose a couple of these things and then respond. Um, I'm really glad you asked about the novel as a thing. You were asking about it in terms of a transnational context, you know, transcultural flow is sort of the phrase you were using, which makes a lot of sense in this period. Um, but when I think about the novel as a thing, I think this was the moment in uh, reception of the novel in Russia when it was really being treated as a thing that could be taken apart and then kind of like reconstructed into a philosophical system, right? So the concern, I guess, in previous decades and um, these kinds of big debates in the journals um, about the status of realism, really kind of um, social, but also aesthetic questions that were being kind of like batted back and forth. In this period, the people I'm working on they really are taking these huge liberties from the novel and dissecting it in ever in any way that they possibly want to. And for the most part, it has to it has to do with this real kind of conviction many of them had that Dostoevsky didn't quite manage to systematize. He didn't create like a total a totality in his novelistic world. Um, maybe that was sort of a failure of his aesthetic system. Sometimes I think they're kind of approaching that critique, um, maybe it was just the fact that he died. <laughs> and he, you know, like this kind of promise of a writer, right, who dies before he manages to finish his system is really one of these myths that comes up in this period and that you can't really get away from in any period. So I want to say the novel as a thing is really important, it, not in a transcultural flow, but in a sense of its being just completely abandoned um, as a social, you know, as like a kind of social um, project, that kind of realistic project. Um, realism, the project of realism. So that's my first response to that. And then the next question I wanted to respond to is uh, the one where you um, pushed us on global modernism. Um, I think it's a really great question. How do we, and, and, and relatedly sort of decolonizing modernism and, and Russian, Russian modernism. And I think that's a really great question to ask. I think that's actually happening in, um, you know, the field, people who work on Russian modernism are kind of moving away from this focus on word and image and all of the kind of symbolist fascination with um, coming up with a perfect description of what symbolist art is, um, all of these sorts of interesting pseudo philosophical kind of like, um, you know, writings that they came up with. There's been a lot of really great work on that. But now I think people are more interested in the cultural syncretism of the time. Um, the fact that you have poets like Baidemont who are sort of borrowing from here and there. Um, obviously inspired by multiple cultures, multiple nations, multiple ethnic groups, but kind of assimilating them within um, their own kind of Russian tradition. And that I think we could probably work on more. Um, this question of how are different, um, you know, how are different ethnic groups um, or, or kind of invented histories about the history of human culture. How are those things being received in this era and attached to this kind of more insulated, insular debate in, in Russian tradition about, you know, but what about Russian literature? What does it mean? What, what is our role in the world? Um, I think it would be great to continue to look at the kind of nationalism of, of you know, Russian symbolism, 
and that cultural syncretism because there is a kind of colonizing um, of other cultures. So I'll sort of leave it there. Those are kind of broad answers, but thank you very much for the questions. Great, thank you both for your responses. Um, I, I wanna point out to the, the uh, attendees that you are encouraged and welcome to uh, submit your questions via the Q&A feature. And I see there's one question which I'm going to read. Um, it comes from Emily Wang. Um, Thanks to all the speakers and organizers for a wonderful afternoon. I have two small questions, Emily writes. Uh, Jose, could you elaborate on how Joyce's status as an Irish writer inscribing himself into an Anglophone English tradition paralleled or failed to parallel the position of Russian language emigre writers? And then Emily asks, Lindsay, to your knowledge, did Rosanov's philo-Semitic version of Dostoevsky take into account those elements of the novelist's work that many critics now read as anti-Semitic. So uh, a question for Jose and a question for Lindsay, go ahead. Sorry, I have to press all these buttons. Uh, thanks Emily for your question. Um, I, I, think, I think the difference here would be Joyce having the struggle, right, of, of being an Irish writer trying to inscribe himself into the Anglophone and English tradition. Um, and that's one of the things he he, he lists is, is the struggles of language, religion, Catholicism, um, and the uh, English state. How do you create this identity for yourself as this new Irish writer uh, writing in a language that's not your own in the sense that it's it's Ireland versus England. Um, but for the Russian writers, I think what's maybe more operative here and speaks to, to Bella's third question or the final bit of the, her question to me um, is Joyce as an exile, as someone who is writing from um, uh, away from home, away from, from Ireland, um, and can get that perspective to write about uh, Ireland and Dublin now living in Europe and in a part. Um, so that's one thing. And then the second is the sort of myth, I suppose, in, in a sense, um, of Joyce as a peripheral writer. And, and I think I mentioned this in the talk that um, he's a peripheral writer, not in the sense that he's not part of the establishment, certainly now and certainly after Ulysses was published. Um, he was there when all of these things were happening in Europe and part of these groups and um, producing these texts that everyone is reading, engaging with, obviously, and even in Russia. Um, but his coming from Ireland and feeling apart from the center, I think, spoke to some of these Russian writers. Um, and maybe for Nabokov there, yes, being apart in that sense, um, being separated from your homeland and being peripheral in that sense. Um, that question of does is what you're writing outside of Russia count as Russian literature? Um, are you preserving that tradition or are you doing something new? Um, is it going to fail? Is it going to survive and, and flourish apart from, from the soil and from the, the language back there? Um, certainly spoke to, to these writers. Um, but yeah, again, I suppose it's, it's all this mythology of Joyce. If, um, the emigre, the exile, and um, the kind of posturing <laughs> that comes with that, um, that was very generative for, for, for Joyce, certainly, and some of these other writers. Thanks, Emily. Um, but was, I've really only scratched the surface in this talk. Um, you know, of Rosanov's extremely complicated relationship with Dostoevsky. Um, it evolved in the same way that Mirishkovsky's, um, you know, favoritism for him evolved. Rosanov, I think much later when he was pretty prominently anti-Semitic, um, probably found much more of an affinity with Dostoevsky's writings, especially in Diary of a Writer. Rosanov quotes Diary of, a Lighter, Diary of a Writer a lot. And we know that he's reading um, those writings very closely at the 
at this period in Rosenev's thinking, I don't think the kind of dissident dissonance between his philo-Semitic Dostoevsky and and Dostoevsky evidence and Dostoevsky's own writings that he clearly he didn't really share that any of that um, didn't share that worldview at all. In fact, quite the opposite. I don't think that bothered Rosenow in the same way that the this particular quality of Rosenow's analytical approach is that there's no dissonance whatsoever. Everything is sort of united in Rosenow's stylist, stylistics, like and and his sort of bizarre way of analyzing things. I mean, he just decides that he wants an Egyptian hieroglyphic to be interpreted in this particular way. And then suddenly Svidrigailov becomes really just, um, you know, like a natural um, <laughs> kind of example to illustrate something about Egyptian hieroglyphics. So I, I as, a, as someone who is not like, you know, um, I don't kind of know back and forth all of that Rosenow wrote um, between this turn of the century period until he, the, the day that he died in 1919. It could be that he reflected on this, you know, in a more complex way at a later point in his more anti-Semitic phase, but I'm, I'm afraid I haven't scratched that. <laughs> I haven't opened that door. It's a better metaphor. Well, thank you for those answers and thanks, Emily, for that question. The Q&A function should still be open and available. Uh, aha, there's a, a question from Valeria Sobel. Uh, she writes, thank you both for fascinating presentations. I have a question for Lindsay. Do you feel that there's a boundary between race as a metaphor, Tolstoy is a Jew, Semite, and race as a, in quotes, real thing, Shostov as a, in quotes, Yid, or was it Valensky? Even as Miroshkovsky uses a similar language to describe Tolstoy's version of Christianity and that of the ethnically Jewish critics and philosophers. I know that race is not a real thing, of course, but being an actual Jew had certain implications at the time. I'm curious if he's aware of the slippery boundaries. Go ahead, Lindsay. And thank you, Valeria, for that question. Thank you, Valeria. Um, I I would like to find concrete evidence to say that he was aware of those slippery boundaries. Um, in the article and chapter version of this talk, I really try to make an effort to show at least, you know, in terms of historical coincidence, the rise of physical anthropology, the fact that many journals of the time were using these typologies. And in many times, these racial typologies were coming up in close proximity with what we would consider to be kind of political understandings of anti-Semitism. There was a pretty big resonance between these things. I mean, it's hard for me to think that this kind of personal anti-Semitism um, that we clearly see in Miroshkovsky's letters correlated with this more kind of academic understanding of what these terms meant in for example, the study of the history of Christianity. Um, I don't, so I basically argue that we have kind of enough evidence that there's an overlap. Um, but I also think if we look at Mirzkowski's biography as a whole, it's, it's difficult to not think that there was a connection um, between personal kind of animus and um, the use of these terms as, as you know, concrete analytical terms, being that later in his life, Miroshkovsky uh, corresponded with Mussolini and had all kinds of other really strange, um, you know, uh, very problematic, you know, historically connections to the far right. So um, I guess that's how I'll answer that question. But what you bring up is absolutely like the complicated part of this research. And so I appreciate so much um, the question. Yeah, thank you, uh, Lindsay. And thank you, Valeria, uh, for, for the answer and the question. Again, the Q&A is open. Please uh, uh, don't hesitate to contribute questions. I think we have time for maybe another question or two. Uh, 
in the meantime, um, Lindsay, I was thinking when when you responded to the the sort of the question about the status of the novel. Of course, I mean the other thing that's happening during the time period you're examining is, um, as far as canonical novels are concerned, there, there's not a great number of them produced during these years. There is actually a, a great market for kind of what you might call second-rate novels, but the first, the sort of the canon, the Dostoevsky. The novels of the Dostoevsky mold are, are a thing of the past in a certain sense. And so um, I, I don't know to what extent that that that's something to take into account that that actually this the these um, thinkers build so much of what they do um, in 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 the context of this this kind of post-novelistic or at least post-realist certainly moment. Um, I think that's a good point. And I think one of the things I'm really fascinated by in this period is that the symbolists, they, they really did have their own canon as well that I think, and, and I think it contributed to more people paying attention to a novel like Devils, for example, which, um, you know, in my understanding of their reception, I see them trying to save that novel, I guess, from a legacy forever associated with kind of anti-revolutionary forces to, you know, they kind of converted into this novel about sort of double faith. I mean, like the kind of native Russian spirituality that is represented in the novel by an unlikely, you know, disabled kind of half mad woman. They do all these things to that novel, which at the time was so controversial that, um, and, it, and it really does, in my understanding of their reception of his body of work, it really does kind of become more important to them uh, than Brothers Karamazov, more philosophically important. And again, that there's that distinction between whether we treat something as a work of art or whether it's just, it's offering a kind of body of thought and then it what its real significance is just material for a philosophical system that's really what the distinction is for them in my view i mean that makes sense and it's sort of i i guess that was also my initial question about how we read Dostoevsky differently you know when we read him through the silver age that you know in a way to sort of recalibrate the the canon within the canon right they recalibrate um what's important about the Stajewski. Um, Jose, I was wondering, there's a question I, I sort of didn't ask because I, I thought I would, you know, uh, save time, but I was, I was really curious to, um, one, to hear specifically more about, about Maidenhair and, and just the, the Joycean dimensions of it. Um, and then the other thing I was wondering uh, was to what extent you, foreground the historical circumstances like in other words is it is there is there a joyce of the russian aughts if that makes sense of the russian you know, 2000s um or to what extent do you read the gift in the course of this book as a 1930s you know as a novel of 1930s europe um so so i'm wondering um i guess to what extent you place a point of emphasis um, on on the, the sort of the historical moment or circumstances as something that produce that produces um, its own version of a Russian Joyce. Thank you again. Yeah, uh, starting with the second question, that's definitely um, one of the main components of of this project to not just look at the the intertextual connections, the texts as such, these, these novels, again, these big books, um, but to contextualize them, so text and context. And, and for me, the version of Joyce that they're reading, again, is not monolithic, it's not a single Joyce, and it is uh, largely <laughs> dependent on when they're reading him and where they're reading him. Um, so for Eliasha in the mid-20s, um, when all these changes are going on and restrictions are you know, starting to ramp up, that's going to affect how he reads him with the bulk of um, that was, uh, you know, generally describing um, the bulk of being in exile, 
is responding to some of the same concerns that Joyce and Stephen struggle with. Um, and these questions of what an artist is supposed to do or be or how to represent their their nation and whether they can become this new new being, I guess. Um, and then the, the other two cases are Bitov and, and Sokolov um, that I didn't really get into. Um, and for Bitov, for me, the context there is certainly this post-Stalin kind of reevaluation of what was lost, what wasn't available at the time, and the sense of being belated, being lost, that I think runs throughout many of these cases. But for, for Bitov and his generation, it's very, very strong. Um, and there's this great line where the, the grandfather of the main character in, in Pushkin's Dome and Pushkin House says that you'll read Joyce in however many years and think that you're that you've accomplished something special, but you haven't, right? This all happened before, you're belated, um, you've missed this all. Um, so that context is what he's dealing with. And for Sokolov, um, he, he emigrated too, but he was writing uh, School for Fools while still in Russia. And for me, I mean, that, that's probably the least political of the novels for me, um, beyond how he's responding to socialist realism and Soviet propaganda, I suppose. Um, but what he latches on to more than any of the, the previous writers is Joyce's language. This is a point at which you can start playing with stream of consciousness and some of the structural uh, devices that uh, Joyce developed or implemented, I suppose, um, in Ulysses and then Shishkin, certainly coming out of the 90s. Um, and then the conclusion for, for, for my book, I, I interviewed a number of writers um, and uh, living contemporary writers. And the consensus is that there's, again, many Joyce's and a lot of the same debates that were taking place in the 20s uh, when Joyce was being called or his works were being called worms that are writhing in dung and it's like a terrible decadent thing or you know the, the one object that we should preserve for posterity. Um, those same sort of debates are happening now what's Joyce is either something that's passe and not worth our time or you know we've we've all seen this before or he, he's championed in the ways that he was uh, previously um and no one could really give me a Russian Joyce there's no equivalent Russian Joyce a Russian writer um I think writers like Sakolov and Shishkin um and others are following in this tradition and using a lot of his devices and, and developments, but making them their own and, um, uh, you know, adding Russian elements to them. But um, he's still a very complicated figure in, in Russian culture today. Um, and, and for Maiden Hair, uh, as I mentioned in the talk, I think two of the big ones is for Shishkin, this idea that we can bring together all of world culture, Western, Russian, a bit more of the world, but mostly those things, um, and unite all these different voices, just like uh, it happens in Finnegan's Wake, where it's a big jumble of things, this new new babble of, of uh, sources and uh, dialogues and uh, discourse. Um, yeah. Great. Well, terrific. Thank you. Um... Thank you, Jose, and thank you, Lindsay, both for your uh, terrific presentations. I think that all of us look forward to, to reading your articles, books, um, and getting to know your work um, a bit better. This has been a wonderful introduction, I think, to two really impactful, um, important projects. So thank you for that. I want to do two things as we close. First, I want to be sure to invite everybody who is watching to the um, upcoming installments of the Race in Focus series. Um, they'll take place on February 12th, February 19th, and February 26th. You can find all of this information online. Um, and but we hope very much that you will join us again for, for the upcoming um, um, installments. And I would like to um, thank my colleagues at the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. Notably, I would like to thank Jujana Magdo, uh, Sarah Pastorini, and Laura Short um, for, their, um, for their work on this. So thank you so much. <laughs>